you guys, I didn't realize until I was saying hello to you as you're coming into church today that I haven't seen some of your forearms in like months. And I'm so happy because that means summer is upon us. Uh, I spend like the half of my life, I'm not here in this building, out at the youth baseball fields. And so I was out there yesterday and I got a little sunburn on my right arm. I was keeping the scorebook. And I realized like as the sun hits you, it marks you. Like you can't unsee that you have been out in the sun. You know, I think I got a little sunburn on my nose and uh, you know, it's great, it's summer. We have waited for this day for what seems like years, right? I'm excited, I'm excited. But you've heard that phrase before, haven't you? Like you can't unsee it. You heard that? It kind of started in the political world, like uh, the idea that once you see an injustice, you shouldn't unsee it, you need to go and fix it. Uh, But I like how it's migrated into the world of internet comedy because I am young enough to love memes and jokes on the internet. So the idea is that you can't unsee something. Maybe you didn't see it before, but once you do notice it, you can't unsee it again. So if you don't know me, my name is Buzz. I serve here as a lead pastor, and I do like to spend time on the internet, but I've redeemed it this week by using it for my sermon preparation. So for example, here is one thing that you've probably seen 100 times, and maybe you haven't seen exactly what they want you to see. So this is just a FedEx logo, right? Uh, Federal Express. This is the company that brings you your Amazon packages every two days or every day or however, three times a day. I don't know what your Amazon rhythm is, but thank God for Federal Express and and people like this who give us what we need. But did you see, have you ever seen before that there's like a little arrow in the X, the EX? Have you seen that before? That is the arrow that points to your house so that you know when your spouse has spent too much money on Amazon. Like that's what they really want that arrow to be right there. But once you've seen it, now you've seen it, you'll never be able to unsee it again. It's in your brain, your Welcome. Thank you, FedEx, for what you do. This next company got me through college, probably. Uh, It's Wendy's. Man, there was a Wendy's like down the street from my school, and I would go there for the dollar burgers. That's how old I am. We could spend a dollar and get a whole burger. Have you guys seen Wendy's logo? I think we've got it for you here as well. Amazing. Aren't you hungry? I kind of am. It's 11 o'clock. And if you zoom in, there's actually a hidden message in the Wendy's logo. Did you see that? You see that on her collar? What does her collar say? It says, Mom, isn't that nice? They just want to know that who should be coming through our drive through to satisfy their screaming children, right? Mom, there we go. Now we know who Wendy's is interested in attracting to their restaurant. I never saw that before, but now that I've seen it, I'll never be able to unsee it. I know that this is what Wendy's is about. And so the reason I'm sharing these photos with you is for a bit of fun, but also because we're kicking off a new series today that we're calling Images of the Kingdom. I've been excited for this series for some time because there's something in the teaching of Jesus that is like these photos, that once you see the truth in what Jesus tells us is true about the world, you can never unsee it. You shouldn't want to unsee it. You should wanna go and live it out. We're here at Element Church. We're passionate about becoming followers of Jesus Christ and putting his teachings into practice. And we often say it this way, that we exist to guide people to experience life to the fullest, to connect into meaningful relationships and to make a lasting impact. And We believe that living out this relationship with Jesus is the best way to do that. And what better way to find out what he is all about than looking at his teachings recorded for us in the Bible, in the books we call the Gospels. Now, Jesus often taught people in a format called parables. And a parable is a short story drawn from a realistic, lifelike scenario designed to teach us a little bit more about what the world is like, the world that he's designed for us, what it's really like, the world he wants us to experience. What is it really like? like. And Jesus often uses a term called the kingdom of God to describe this. In other words, it's designed to help us see clearly what life might be like if we lived in a space where our Lord Jesus was king over everything. There's a space where he rules and reigns and has his way, a a life to the fullest, we might say, that's lived out in concert with the Holy Spirit, available to us even now and all around us. It's breaking out everywhere, but Sometimes I think we're so used to drifting through life with the cares and worries of this world, pressing on us, distracting us, just trying to make it through the day. We don't see the kingdom breaking out. It's like that FedEx logo or the mom in the Wendy's. It's like staring you in the face. If only you could see it, but the rest of it is just distracting you. Jesus' parables will give us a time to stop and to think and to listen and to consider carefully and to see that kingdom breaking out. And once you see this kingdom breaking out, you'll never be able to unsee it. You won't want to unsee it. And it's root, Jesus' teaching in the gospels is that the kingdom is where the king is in charge. 
And the king of kings is Jesus Christ. So the kingdom of God is when people choose to submit themselves to Jesus, to live life as he taught, to rely on him for our righteousness, and to try to build a world that it would be like Jesus himself were building it if he were in our shoes. I mean, imagine that for a second. Can you imagine what the world would be like if everybody was as loving as Jesus Christ was? Man, what a world. Can you imagine seeing a world where everybody lived a life as centered on prayer as Jesus was? Man, what a world. How would that change how you spent time in your day? Like imagine living a life free from worry and stress like Jesus taught. Like, man, that's the kind of world I want to be a part of. Imagine living a life with Jesus at the center and his peace and his hope and his love pouring out all around you. Like imagine being so focused on bringing good into this world, you forgot to worry about what's happening outside. That's a good kind of a world. Imagine what it might be like to be a part of a kingdom where Jesus was in charge and his kindness, his grace, his mercy, his love was what we all experienced each and every day. I mean, that's the kind of world I would wanna be a part of, wouldn't you? It's the kind of space I'd wanna exist in. That's the kind of church that I would want us to be, and it's the kind of family that I want to help raise. It's the kind of a workplace that I would want to be a part of. It's the kind of business that I'd want to start. It's the kind of society and school and even baseball team that I'd want to be a part of because, man, Jesus is amazing. Why don't we want to do what he says? But our world doesn't always look like that, does it? It's hard to see it sometimes, isn't it? Kingdom's hidden a bit, like that FedEx logo where we see the big flashy bold part and we miss the tiny arrow right there. So Jesus' parables are gonna help us take our eyes off the flashy distractions of the world and put them on that space that invites and calls and whispers and then brings us close. I mean, his parables, his stories, they don't shout it out at us. They rather tease and call for us to pay attention, to lean in and see. And once you see, to never unsee it. It's like a secret invitation that he's inviting you to jump into his kingdom. He even taught us to pray this way, didn't he? And this phrase of prayer has shaped my prayer life more than any other. Jesus says that when we should pray, we pray this way, may your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. Because in heaven, Jesus is in charge. In heaven, he rules and reigns. He's the king. It's easy to see him. Logos in bold, but... In heaven, there's love and forgiveness and wholeness and no more suffering, no more pain. Hope is assured because it's lived out. You can see Jesus face to face with his grace and mercy and peace. But here on earth, it's hidden. It's harder to see. You gotta look for it a little bit more. And we yearn for that day where we can see it fully, but it's not yet today. So that's what our images series is gonna be all about finding a way to see the kingdom, see these snapshots that Jesus gives us of what life would be like if we lived it out as he taught us to bring it into focus and make it a part of our world, to bring that kingdom here to earth as it is in heaven. And I wanna let our Lord Jesus, our teacher or rabbi, as some call him, to help us to see it. Because for some of us, the kingdom is less like a FedEx logo and more like this famous photo. You seen this photo before? I love this photo, you guys. This Bigfoot, if you haven't met him, a close personal friend of mine, is this photo was captured in Bluff Creek in the 60s. A lot of times you see a photo like this and you wonder, like, is that even real? Like, does Bigfoot even exist? Is it a fake? Is somebody lying to me about having seen it? We even see a photo evidence and we still doubt it. You might be worried, like, does Buzz really believe in Bigfoot? Man, I want to, you know? That would be amazing if Bigfoot were real. I really hope that it is. It's okay to doubt Bigfoot, right? I think it would be awesome. Maybe the problem is what the comedian Mitch Hedberg said, that Bigfoot himself is blurry, and that's why we cannot get a photo of him. If there's a scary out-of-focus monster out there, it's very scary. When you think about it, like when I described like a kingdom of love and joy and peace and forgiveness and grace and mercy, some of you thought, yeah, right. That's probably not real. I know somebody told me about it. I know somebody took a photo of it, but it doesn't exist. It's like Bigfoot or his convention partner, the Loch Ness Monster. It's not real. Get out of here with that kingdom stuff, we might think. 
Can you discover it? Can you experience it? Is it worth seeking and finding it when I feel like I've looked for a long time and never found it? And I think it is. I think it's worth looking for. I think it's worth hunting for. And even though the world we see now, we see the kingdom breaking in, but it's not like a face-to-face meeting with Jesus. In fact, it's what the great New Testament writer C.H. Dodd said, the already and the not yet of the kingdom. By this, he means that there's already aspects of the kingdom that are all around us, but it's not yet here all the way. Not all the way. The Apostle Paul put it this way in the book of 1 Corinthians. In chapter 13, he says that when I was a child, in verse 11, he says, I spoke and I thought and I reasoned just like a child. But when I grew up, I put away those childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we'll see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now, it's just partial, it's incomplete, but then I'll know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. These three things will last for forever, faith and hope and love. The greatest of these is love. See what Paul's kind of saying? It's like a fuzzy picture. You can't quite see it clearly. It's hidden in there. One day we'll see it face to face, but that day's not yet today. In the meantime, we gotta work for it. We've gotta look for it. We've gotta pursue it and seek it and find it. Because Jesus is here, you guys. The kingdom is breaking in. In fact, the kingdom came into its fullness in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And now we've got to find the kingdom he's left behind for us. We've got to find that arrow. We've got to read that mom on the collar. We've got to go into the wilderness spaces and find that Bigfoot and dive to the depths of the sea and find that Loch Ness monster and bring that kingdom of heaven that is eternal here into this temporary world It's not obvious always how to do that, but man, once you see it, you can never unsee it and you won't want to. That's the task of our series. Do you see the kingdom? Do you want to? Do you wanna be a part of bringing that kingdom of heaven here to earth as it is in heaven? So I wanna look at one of these first parables of our Lord's in Matthew chapter five, where he shows us almost like a snapshot, a Polaroid of what it's like to be one of his followers. I'm gonna have the scripture for you on the screen, but if you're here today and you don't have a Bible, man, we would love to give you one. Uh, just hit us at the Next Steps wall or the New Here area, or even come down to our front and pray with our prayer team because this word of God that's contained in the scriptures, man, can change your life. It's changed mine. We want you to be blessed by that as a free gift. And so however you have the scriptures today, let's turn to Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter five, verse 13. Jesus tells us, you are the salt of the earth, But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out, trampled underfoot. You, you are the light of the world. Town built on a hill cannot be hidden and and neither do people light a lamp and then just put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand. It gives light to everyone in the house. So in the same way, Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Man, I love here that Jesus doesn't give us an option or like a maybe or like a list of things you have to do or a hill to climb that you're inevitably gonna fall short of perfection on. He's just showing us a photo. He's like, this is what you look like to me. He's using these images of things we see every single day. And he's saying like, look here, it's like the Wendy's logo. There's a hidden message. Look here, it's your life. Did you know it's salting the community? Look here, it's your kingdom that you're bringing. It's like light all over it. Did you see it? Maybe you're not perfect at it. Maybe you're not all the way the finished product, but Jesus is saying, this is who you are. And if you're his follower, this is your identity now. Maybe you didn't even know that. Maybe you aren't even perfect at living it out, but it's true. And that arrow is pointing. It's showing us that the kingdom is right here. It's it's true, and you shouldn't unsee it. Like, you can't unsee that we're called to be salt and light. So if we're salt and light, if this is the image that we're supposed to see, this is the image Jesus is trying to bring into focus for us, what is it that he's saying to us about the kingdom? I wanna highlight just a few things about this image that I think make it true for us, this kingdom in our lives. 
Personally, I think the kingdom of God is preservative. It's preservative. In the ancient world, like in Jesus' day, they didn't have refrigerators. They didn't have food storage like we do. They only had a very few things to make things last. And one of them was salting their food. That's why I say this is like a preservative. It keeps it. It makes it last. Have you ever had beef jerky or elk jerky or my favorite bison jerky or my least favorite turkey jerky? You know what I'm talking about. You got to get the salt in there and it makes the meat last for forever, basically. I mean, if you lay out raw beef on your counter and beef jerky on your counter, which one's going to last? Like after two days, you're going to know, you know, like this one I want to eat and this one we should have thrown out uh, a day ago. Which one is living out its purpose to preserve or to, to keep and to to ensure that it lasts for forever, the salted one, of course. That's part of what Jesus is saying here, that you as his kingdom and as his followers, you're sort of like a salt that's embedded in your world and that as we live out the life of the kingdom bringer, it's going to make it last in a way that we still wanna be a part of instead of old, nasty, rotten meat. And think about it this way, like imagine the patience of Jesus Christ And he gives it to his kingdom bringers, patience. And then as you get salted out into your workplace, you bring that patience with you. And it makes it last and be more beautiful. Now think about that same workplace without the impatience or without the patience that's embedded in you. Like, it's more like that ground beef on the counter, isn't it? Like, your being there makes it last, makes your workplace has more of its original purpose, maybe even rubbing off on a coworker or two. This is what Jesus is saying. He sprinkled you like salt out there to bring his kingdom, to get deep within the meat, to get it nearer to its purpose that it always should have had. Because that's one thing about salt, isn't it? Like once it gets in somewhere, it is impossible to get rid of it. Back when Tara and I were still living on campus at the university, sometimes we'd have students over for dinner. And one great night, one of them offered to cook a meal for us. And I thought, this sounds amazing. And it sounded even better because this guy was from India and Indian food is my favorite. I thought, let's see how it's done. So he went to the grocery store and he got all the ingredients and he got everything that he needed and he put it kind of simmering in the stove top. And curry takes like a long time to just steep those flavors and tasting it along the way. And then he thought, okay, almost done. We just need a little bit more salt, just a little bit more salt, just a little bit more. You guys see what's happening, right? See, Benjamin takes our, our salt shaker, not to name any names. If you're listening to us, Benjamin, thank you for serving my family by cooking your food for us, even though I'm about to make fun of you because he started to sprinkle that like teaspoons worth of salt as he thought in his mind and the lid of course came off as lids do and the whole shaker of salt went right into that curry and you guys groaned and that's how I felt as well because my curry was no longer a delicious chicken curry. It was like a seawater curry. And we tried to rescue it, man. Like, it's a whole, like, mountain on the top. We were scooping out with spoons and, like, but the salt was in there. You can't get it out. You can't, like, run it through the dishwasher. You can't, like, filter it. Like, it's just in there. And we had to order pizza. Very American of us. Once the salt was in there, it was stuck in there doing what it does, preserving, modifying, saltifying. We couldn't get rid of it what Jesus, I think, is hitting at here as he teaches us. He says, how can salt lose its saltiness? There's a bit almost of an absurdity there. Like, it can't do that. It can't lose its own nature. Once the salt gets in there, it's, it's stuck. It preserves. It's doing what it does. And Jesus is saying the same thing about us. Like, once the kingdom gets in you, and once the kingdom in you gets out into the world, like, you can't take it back out. It's stuck in there, just like that seawater curry. But here's the difference. I did not want to eat that curry. But the kingdom of Jesus, it's amazing. It's delicious. It's, it's beyond imagining how good it is. I'll leave you a bit hungry for more. And I am proud of that pun because we're going to talk a little bit more in a minute about how salt makes things delicious. But this is the identity that Jesus says that you have. And inextricably, unexplainably amazing seasoning that preserves this world and enhances every place you touch. That's the kingdom, Jesus says. Can you see it? Sometimes things are hard to see, and that's why Jesus also compares us, I think, to light. So here, 
Secondly, we see that the kingdom is illuminating. So the kingdom preserves and the kingdom illuminates. The light of the world, like city on a hill, and you can't hide it. In other words, like once the lights come on, you can't unsee it anymore. I mean, think about it in reverse. Like, if you're going to hide something at nighttime, the worst thing you can do is turn your lights on, right? Like if you're a soldier trying to sneak past enemy lines, you don't even get to light a small campfire. It gives your position away. It's, it's foolish to do that. If you're playing capture the flag with your friends at night, you don't pull out your phone and check your texts. Like the light gives you away. It tells you where you are. If you get home too late as a teenager, something I never did, not even one time, and you're coming down the street in the driveway, turn your headlights off, you know, so your parents don't see you coming, you know? <laughs> Write that down. That's free knowledge right there. You'd keep your light as low as you could if you're trying to keep people from seeing you coming. But Jesus says, man, that's exactly what the kingdom is like. Like just a little bit of light in the darkness attracts the eye. It's like a beacon that you notice that you can't unsee. Even a pinpoint of light can't be unseen. Jesus says it's like it's set up on a hill so that people most assuredly will be unable to miss it. Nobody, Jesus says, sets the lamp on a lampstand and then covers it. That's absurd. Like an unsalty salt. Like, what is that? Light is meant to attract and to illuminate and to point the way. Why would you hide that? Jesus asks. Your very nature as a Christ follower should point towards God's goodness. The way that the kingdom, like the way Jesus' life and death and resurrection and his forgiveness for your sins has changed you, it should shed light on the fact for everybody that there's a better way. The gospel teaches us that in Jesus, we can find righteousness and forgiveness from sin and peace with God. Why wouldn't we want to point people to that? Why instead do we treat the gospel like our phones at night during capture the flag, checking it as secretly as possible, as out of sight and as hidden as possible? And what could be better news than the gospel? And we are hiding it. I don't get that, man. Why do we put a covering on the lamp? Jesus is amazing. His kingdom is here. I would want people to be a part of it. Wouldn't you? Because the kingdom preserves. Like that kingdom illuminates and the kingdom enhances, number three, everything that it touches. It's almost like the, the choice you get to make when you come into a room at night. It's like, do you want to fumble around in the darkness? And do you want to like step on the Legos? Do you want to like trip over the Ottoman, bump into the cat, not really see what's going on? Or do you just simply flip the lights on and see what the room has to offer? Maybe when you make food, like, do you want to go with just bland beef straight off the shelf, no salt, no seasoning? You could do it. Or do you want to cover your brisket in a beautiful dry rub, let it sit in there and get the flavor deep into the meat overnight. Let it sit at 225 on a wood-burning pellet stove for hours, soaking up the flavor. And man, if you thought you were hungry when I put that Wendy's logo up there, talk about now, because that brisket is just breaking down for eight hours, melts in your mouth. Good, amazing. I mean, sure, you could rip it out of the fridge and put it right into your oven at 425. You can eat it. Who wants that when you can have barbecue brisket? That's like a life without the kingdom. You guys, like once you taste good food, once you see in full light, like you don't want to go back. You can live life that way, but like who wants that? If you fumble around in a dark room once, you don't do it again. After you taste bland food once, like you don't do it again. No contest. You know, in 2004, I had the opportunity to spend some time in Uganda, Africa on mission. And we had some meals way out in rural Uganda. And that, man, those people were amazing. Like some of the kindest, most hospitable, most generous people that this world has to offer. Unbelievable. And one thing that grows locally super well in Uganda is avocados. I don't like avocados. Avocados are great. And plucked like right off a tree in the backyard and handed to you, it's amazing. And avocados are great. By themselves, though, they're like just a little bland. You know, like just a little bland. And so whenever our host would come out with a plate of sliced avocados, it wasn't like suffering to eat it. Just a little bland, you know, but we had to do this for Jesus. So we put that bland avocado in our mouth and ate it. And our host came back into the room and was like, what are you guys doing? Like, why are you eating plain avocado? Why didn't you simply just put some salt on it? We're like, what? There's salt? Unbelievable. Yeah, there's like a little jar on the table, like a little crockery with a tiny spoon. You can take the salt out and season your food. And we thought, man, 
we blew it, you guys. Like, it didn't look like the salt shaker we were used to. We couldn't see the salt, but once we saw it, we could never unsee it. We had to put it on everything we ate for the rest of the month. Because like, avocado's fine. It's just a little bland. Who wants that? But seasoned avocado just changes the game, doesn't it? I know which one I would go for. And that's the choice he gives us in life as well, I think. Like, do you want a bland life, like unseasoned avocado? We live that way. You get up, go to the gym, go to work, find a meal, come home to the TV, surf your phone, crash into bed, do it again. You can do it. Who wants that? Or do you want to live a life that's seasoned with the salts of the kingdom, illuminated by the light of Jesus Christ, filled with purpose, filled with passion, with the kind of saltiness that gets deep in you and onto everybody else around you and points people towards Christ? I mean, the psalmist, King David, he said, taste and see that the Lord is good. I think Jesus is asking us that same thing. Like, do you see that my kingdom is good? Once you taste it, you don't want anything else. You don't want to unsee it. You don't want to go back to your bland flavor of being. For Jesus, he's saying, it's an easy choice. Walk in darkness or walk in light, it's easy. Bland food or amazing meals, which do you want? Which do you want? It's an easy choice. I mean, it's hard because of the cost. It's hard because of the distraction. It's hard because he demands everything of you. But it's easy, man. I know I'm choosing light. I know I'm choosing seasoning. That's what I want to do. And I want to help everybody else do it too. You know, Jesus calls us this light of the world because he expects us to point people towards him. And in verse 16, which we read, he, he said it this way. He said, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That's the kind of life I want to live that points people towards goodness in Christ. That's the kind of church I want to be at, at Element Church, that as we bring his kingdom here locally in Cheyenne at Element, it's the kind of place I want to be. Like, I want us to be so easy to see in this city that people know where the kingdom is breaking out. I don't want them to look for God like they look for Bigfoot and wonder, is he even real? I want them to know where they can find him. I want us to be so good at salting God's presence into our community that Cheyenne becomes like a next level kind of a meal. Some beautiful banquet that his kingdom ambassadors and kingdom bringers are a part of preparing for our city to feast at. I want people to hunt for God's goodness like the Loch Ness Monster and just wonder if it's real. I want them to see our church like a city on a hill to experience that salt in their communities in the person of you and know that, man, God loves them because they told me so. And I'm proud to say, we're, we're on the way. We're doing a pretty good job. I don't know if you are here with us last week, but we heard from Gerald uh, what his life was like as he was changed by the generosity of people of God as a compassion kid growing up in the Dominican Republic. And I'm so thrilled that 59 of us answered that call and said, we want to sponsor a child in Colombia. And so today, 59 kids have meals and shelter and water and education that did not last week because of your generosity. And that's the salt and light of the kingdom in action. Thank you for your generosity, for answering the bell. We don't have to go all the way to South America to see that in action. In fact, in just about an hour, we're gonna host between 250 and 300 families in our Element Food Pantry just around the corner to get food and needs met and a prayer and a love of Jesus right in their hands and in action. That's because of your generosity, your faithfulness, and your heart for Christ. It's amazing. That's salt and light in action. Right next door, we have our Play City Outreach where there's hundreds of moms and dads through the week can bring their kids into a safe space that's clean and well lit, that they get to enjoy time as a family sometimes when the weather outside doesn't permit. It's every single day, you guys, the city on a hill is beckoning and attracting people to say, Jesus loves you, we do too. We wanna show you, man, thank you for your generosity, for your faithfulness in putting these things into practice. Man, it's worth celebrating. It's worth being a part of, I think. So I wanna ask you to be a part of it. In fact, we have a new tool for you to do that on, uh, on your seat back. This is a perforated card, and I know it's perforated because I accidentally ripped it. I'm not a magician. I should be, you guys. And so on the front, we have our, uh, our picture, but on the back is a way for you to both get connected if you'd rather do it on paper than digitally. 
Ashley invited you to connect with the digital card, which you can, but sometimes paper and pen is just easier. We invite you to do that. If you have prayer requests or needs or you want to know what it means to take a next step around here, just fill it out. We have some boxes on the way out to collect this, or you can hand it to an usher or at our new here wall. And then on the bottom, uh, we're creating these like spiritual next steps for you as well. If you're saying like, I want to be a part of bringing that kingdom in my own life, maybe you want to memorize the key scripture that we went today. Check that box and hold yourself accountable. Maybe you have to pray for somebody to forgive, which we'll talk about in a couple of weeks from now. Man, fill it out. Maybe you have a prayer request that you want to have prayer for. Put that on those notes and put it in the bag. Maybe you just want to remind yourself what God showed you as we explored his scriptures today and as we connected to him in worship. Man, write it down. Keep it with you. Don't hide it under a bushel and throw it in a trash can. Keep it in front of yourself and grow in Christ. And so this is just a simple tool for you to do that. We also have some fun this uh, coming weeks with these like uh, Polaroid frames. Maybe you saw these in the lobby and I think it's Aaron, the service, taking photos of our community, our kingdom in action as we go around this church and love and serve one another. I'm not like the silliest person, but I like that you can kind of like put your head in here and kind of looks like a photo, you know? I don't think they're gonna let me take any pictures because they want somebody less ugly than me. And that's fine, you know? So if you are less ugly than me, or even if you're more ugly than me, you be the judge. Get out there into the lobby. Take a photo of your family in action. Take a photo of yourself serving. Take a photo of yourself giving. Take a photo of yourself just participating in the beautiful kingdom life that Jesus Christ has given us. And then in the coming weeks, we're gonna have some of these portraits on the stage. Not to celebrate how great we are, but to see the community in action, being salt, being light, bringing glory to our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, so I don't know how this teaching of Jesus hits you in Matthew chapter five. For me, it's one of the most challenging in all of the scriptures. To be salt, to be light, how can you even do that? So as we prepare to enter back into a time of worship, I wanna just ask you to reflect on these questions. Like, are you preserving? Are you being the kind of salted life that's bringing the kingdom wherever that you are? Are you a person of peace at home? Are you a person of love in your workplace? Are you a person of service in your community? Maybe God's asking you to consider that. Put that on your card, write that down. Pray about that this week. Are you a person who's illuminating the gospel like this light of the world Jesus talked to us about today? Or are you putting it under a lampstand and hiding it a little bit more? Jesus says, don't do that, man. Don't cover that up. Is there somebody in your life he's asking you to point the way to the kingdom for? Third element, we often call that person our one. We have a core value saying, if only for the one. So there's somebody in your space, in your family, in your school, on your team, in your neighborhood. That one that jumps into your hand when, or to your head when I'm asking you, who are you pointing the kingdom to? That's your if only for the one, one. And I'd love to ask you to commit to pray for that person every week this series that the light and salt of Christ's kingdom would get into their heart. That's your one, man. Seek them, save them, bring the kingdom to them. Maybe there's some of us in here today that have tasted the kingdom, seen the kingdom, and we're considering, is it worth it? Should I keep going? I wanna say to you today, absolutely yes. It's worth it to keep going. It's hard sometimes when the busyness and flashiness of the world presses in on the still quiet voice of the kingdom. So I'd love to pray, especially for you today. If you're feeling like turning away from Jesus and going back, that he'd stand with you. So would you just close your eyes and bow your heads as I pray? Lord, I pray for everybody in here that's experiencing your teaching that we are salt and light. And Lord, I especially pray for those of us that are feeling like keeping going is hard. And it's almost like we want to go back. Lord, protect us. Keep us tasting your goodness, seeing the light of the world, Jesus Christ, and pressing in. Lord, many of us are are held back by chains of grief and sorrow. Lord, break those chains. Lord, many of us are distracted by the cares and worries of this world. Even the good things you have given us, Lord, help us to cut through that and see you and only you at the center. Lord, may we be people bold enough to point others towards you. May we be persistent enough to grow your kingdom deep in our hearts. And Lord, not in our own strength, but in yours, we pray. Equip us by your Holy Spirit to live a life fully transformed and given over to you. 
So Lord, as we continue to worship and, and sing our praises to you, would you speak to our hearts what you want us to do to bring your kingdom this week? Lord, help us to not leave here even unchanged, but to be submitted to your will in every way and in every season. Be with us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.